For many of us, elephants have traditionally been a source of entertainment, of spectacle. But these majestic creatures are a reminder of a long lost time. And by studying their ancestors, we can learn a lot about our own past. Before elephants, there were mammoths, there were mastodons, there was Jack. I came to the University of Michigan in 1979. When I arrived, I was nominally an invertebrate paleontologist. That is, the bulk of my projects had to do with marine organisms without backbones, very different sorts of animals than, than we have here. But in fact, I had some background working on animals like this. And in those first weeks, there was first one and then a second mastodon found. The first one, I went out just as a colleague and, and new neighbor to help. The second one happened to be during the annual meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, and all the vertebrate paleontologists were off to that meeting. With his colleagues away on business, Dan led the excavation of this second mastodon, and when he compared the two sites, he realized that he had two mastodons preserved in entirely different ways. What was the reason for that? And as I worked on that and thought about it, I began to realize something was going on with that second one. And I finally decided that something was humans, human butchery. And that got me started on working on this problem of what happened to, to mastodons and mammoths around the end of the Pleistocene or Ice Age and I just was drawn into that subject matter more and more and over the course of a few years converted most of my research program to working on these things. Ultimately, Dan changed the focus of his research because he found himself intrigued by two problems. One was to know more about human history. Since there was evidence of human activity, of course I was interested in what these people were doing, how they lived, how they interacted with these animals. At the same time, I was really interested in the biology of the animals. And it was only about maybe two years after this um, sort of early baptism in, <laughs> in studies like this that there was yet another mastodon that was found. And at that site, a backhoe that had been digging, actually a swimming pool in someone's backyard, had cracked into two tusks, broken them. And when I first visited the site and saw those broken tusks, on one of those fracture surfaces where the tusk had, had broken open, I saw these very clear lines or layering, pattern of layering in the tusk structure. And it was so regular, it was a sort of color banding. It seemed to me, well, first of all, it definitely was a record of the growth of the tusk, its growth in layers. But moreover, it seemed to me that that was so regular, it had to be something like tree rings. And that meant that there was a record of the animal's life, to some extent, in that tusk. I brought that specimen uh, back to the museum began immediately to cut it and slice it and polish it and look at it under a microscope, realized that there were even finer scale structural features layering uh, within that, realized that there was a, ultimately a weekly and a daily record even inside of years. And that just completely blew my mind, <laughs> but also promised that there would be uh, detailed information on the animal's life and growth history and so forth. And I knew that from that we could answer lots of questions about the ecology of these times, the biology of the animals, and ultimately the nature of their interaction with humans. When I began this work, there really wasn't much known about these animals. Of course, we knew their basic relationship to modern elephants. We knew their basic anatomy, but my predecessors at the Museum of Paleontology at the University of Michigan had gotten to the point where they were reacting to new reports of mastodons 
Oh, guess we have to go get another one. They wanted to do the responsible thing and collect a specimen so that if someone wanted to study it sometime, it would be available. But they were tired of them and not giving them much attention. So when I began this work, I was not only dealing with newly discovered specimens, but I was going down into our basement collection storage area, opening old crates, pulling out bones that hadn't been looked at in years, laying them out on boards set up on cement blocks, anything I could do to begin to understand what had been found already and build my library of, let's say, case knowledge. I have never lost that sense of, oh, here's another opportunity. <laughs> here's another opportunity to answer these these questions that really cry out for new information. In fact, the way I've framed the questions really requires a sample of sites. One site is never, never enough. One site is just one example. It's like trying to do sociology by interviewing one person. It won't work. If you want to understand what these animals were doing, you have to have males and females and young and old and not just one of each. You need to have ultimately tens of examples. Of course we can, can have ten two-year-olds and ten three-year-olds, but you have to have a multiplicity of individuals. Remember oh, there's also the history here. So we have to sample animals from far back in time and we have to sample animals from near the time of extinction. And in fact, much of the story that we're learning comes from comparing how were things long before extinction? How were things as we approach extinction? How were things on the eve of extinction? And it's only by integrating all that information that, that you have a solid understanding of what was going on. And so I am never bored <laughs> or complacent about the opportunity to, to add another animal, another site to our understanding of this time. Next, on Jack. About two years ago, I was here with some students from the Fowler Center. We were down in the creek here looking for fish, and I noticed that there was something in the water that resembled firewood, but it didn't look quite right. We found out it was a bone. 